guys, I'm Perry Nemiroff, and I am so, so happy to be back here on Collider Best of the Week, the place to go if you don't have enough time to watch all the videos that go up on the Collider Videos YouTube channel or to read all the great articles that are on Collider.com and you want them all in one nice, neat little spot. Clearly, we were very busy with Comic-Con last weekend, so this is going to be a Comic-Con heavy episode, and let's just jump right into it. The Movie Talk panel was talking about the new Wonder Woman trailer, so let's check out the discussion on that one. We kind of had a little divide in our our little Collider press room 411B. You know, half of us were like, oh, we like the Wonder Woman trailer more. So half of us like the Justice League trailer more. I personally thought the Wonder Woman trailer was the best trailer I saw all at Comic-Con. I thought, it look, I was already looking forward to this movie because Batman v Superman, people know, like I liked it, but I didn't love it. But the two best things for me were, were Batman, Ben Affleck as Batman and Wonder Woman. We didn't see a lot of her, but her her action sequences look great. Yeah, you mentioned the action. That was the highlight of this trailer for me, and it was something that I really liked. I did not love the trailer as a piece of art, and the reason why is just, I just think it opened a little weak. I didn't like the way that the trailer opened. I thought it was the wrong way to show us the first glimpse of the Wonder Woman standalone movie to have her on top of Chris Pine. I know that that's an integral part of the story that they're telling. I just didn't like the way that it opened, but once we got into the action sequences, I was like, Patty Jenkins is the right person to be directing this movie. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with you. I thought the opening was incredible. I thought it was a, I thought it was one of the best trailers I've seen at Comic Con in a long time. I actually really, really enjoyed the way it opened up. I thought by her approaching, we we we've always heard of the legend of Steve Trevor. I mean, and Wonder Woman. You know, we've never seen it on screen ever. We have never seen the two of them on screen in their own movie. And if it was, it was some crap porn or something. But you know, as far <laughs> as like an actual film, we haven't seen it yet. And when they showed up, and it's because they bookended it. They booking it really well. Starts off with her discovering him, talking about the fact that she's never seen a man, that she is it was created by Zeus, and then at the very end having that little kind of tag at the end saying we call it where I'm from, like we call that slavery. It's like all these things that, that start and end, but it's the in between, the meet in the middle that was so interesting. So now let's move on over to Heroes, where they were focusing on the Justice League trailer. I might be Team Wonder Woman in terms of the trailer battle here, but the Justice League trailer was still fantastic as well. Let's check out with the panel thought. This is a series of scenes that really shows you kind of Bruce Wayne putting the team together. Mm -hmm. Stuff that they already let you already know if you saw Batman v Superman, him and Wonder Woman are going to search out these other meta humans that were all on, conveniently on a weird disc with logos and stuff. Don't worry but about that. Yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> they're course correcting this. And by all, by all accounts, by watching this trailer, I'm very much excited to see what Aquaman's all about, what this brand new mm -hmm. Flash is all about. I want to know more about Cyborg. I was really looking forward to seeing Cyborg because I'm a big Teen Titans fan. And while I think the CGI maybe looked a little rubbery, it's not finished, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> don't come after me on the internet like you did when I said Spider-Man look rubbery in that trailer. Right. Uh, but I was just really excited to see that he can literally stand next to all the people of the Justice League and he looks cool. What they're doing with his voice is really neat. And then when I saw him in the panel, I was like, He's a huge <laughs> human being. I couldn't get over that. I loved that how they open it. You know, he came in on the king tide. Right. That's last night. And I was like, this is, I love this. I mean, I, look, is it is it exactly like the comics? No, but it's a movie. I don't understand. I've read so many Elseworlds JLA stories. Like, right. I don't know what JLA you expect. Ben Affleck gives this this trailer a weird grounding. Like and, he kind and a of gravitas. Yeah, yeah, like a really gra a gravitas. And also, it, 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 there's an interesting story choice that they're doing here. And I don't know whether they intended this with Batman v Superman or not. Um, and I noticed it a little bit in the Suicide Squad trailer that we're now entering this weird DC universe where everybody's reacting that Superman is gone. Mm -hmm. Because they show the Superman funeral in the Suicide Squad trailer. Okay. And they mention Superman's death in that trailer. And so this is a Batman that's forming this Justice League because Superman's gone. Right. Yeah. And, and we, gotta, we gotta step up to this thing. Next up over on Jedi Council, they were discussing a pretty big rumor that dropped, if it proves true. And keep in mind, this is unconfirmed, so don't get too carried away with it just yet. There was news that Lucasfilm has picked up Alden Ehrenreich for three movies in which he is going to appear as Han Solo. Even though they ran with the headline Han Solo and Trilogy, it does not necessarily mean it is a Han Solo trilogy, but he could appear in three films as the character. So let's see what the Jedi Council team had to say about that. I think by doing a Han Solo standalone movie, we run into the problem that I, that I pitched to you guys a year, a year and a half ago. This is when you start to limit other movies. So let's say that the first Han Solo movie, smashing success, everyone loves it, and now you want a trilogy of Han Solo movies. Problem is, in between, you hit 
episode 9, episode 10, episode possibly 11, 12, 13, and so on and so on. And then in between that, you're going to get the Han Solo 2, Han Solo 3, which means we're not going to get a uh, Night Hill Republic movie or an Obi-Wan movie. I agree with you, Christian. I think it would be not the smartest move to do Han Solo 1, 2, 3 right in a row. But I do think there's a possibility they could do something where it's like one year we get Han Solo 1, whatever you want to call it. Right. Then we get another Star Wars story. And then the next year, maybe we get Han Solo 2. Um, because I think there is something to be said where it's like, if we all really love this character, it'd be really fun to get more stories that are just focused on him and not just having him be a peripheral character. For me, it feels like Disney is making a safe move. Like he's so popular. It's a popular character. We haven't seen and him yet. And we just lost him. And that we just lost him, so like popularity is an all-time high. So it feels like, well, let's just be safe, and let's just make a Han Solo movie. And you know what? If it works, we'll do three of them. But it goes to your point, Christian. I want to see Old Republic. I want to see Obi-Wan more than Han Solo. I do want to see. Sorry, Mark. But I think an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie has even more potential than a young Han I agree Solo. With you. Over on Collider Nightmares, we discussed another big thing that went down at San Diego Comic-Con. Adam Wingard and Simon Barrett's new movie, The Woods, is not The Woods, it is Blair Witch. So the group talked about the big reveal on that one, and Clark and I both have seen the movie, so we also did a mini review on it as well. Give it to me. <laughs> I want to see this movie now. I am so excited. You're all, a lot of you were in the room when we were working at uh, for Collider at Comic-Con. I squealed like a girl. <laughs> I, and I don't take it back. I love this news so much. I love that they surprised us. I love that it came at Comic-Con. I love that Adam Wingard is doing this. So give it to me now, please. And just for all of you who are kind of pissed that you can't be in on the surprise when you first see the movie, don't worry, because this was just really a great marketing tool. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily affect your reaction to the movie. There's not like a moment in the movie that is spoiled now that you know that it's Blair Witch. It's still gonna play perfectly well. When you sit down in the, to, for the movie, you you figure out in less than five minutes that this is a Blair Witch movie. I mean, this is not something where it hits you like a mm -hmm. ton of bricks 20 minutes in. You're very aware. The first bits of dialogue yeah. say that uh, he's uh, Heather's, Heather's brother. brother. Exactly. So there you have it. Yeah. So just so you know, Perry is absolutely right. I don't even want to call it uh, Blair Witch 2.0. It's more like Blair Witch 1.5, you mm. know? It's like they maintain just enough of the original, but they still adhere to the times and add some new cameras and all that kind of stuff and, and spice up the mythology a little, but yes. not, not too much. So it really is the perfect balance between being a Blair Witch sequel of sorts and also still feeling like that movie that sparked this whole thing to begin with. Yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the things that I liked so much about this was that it it's not a reboot, um, but you could see the movie and never have seen Blair Witch Project mm -hmm. and completely enjoyed it. It's also, it's a direct sequel, but it doesn't feel like you're gonna have sequelitis. You know what I mean? Like, Good. it really does stand on its own. And like you said, Perry, it adds to the things that you love from the first film. Over on the top 10 show, Nost and Roca are ranking some actor-director collaborations. And right now, we're gonna highlight their section on Pulp Fiction. So, spoiler warning for the movie that's 22 years old. I almost took the Hateful Eight just because his part is yeah, technically larger. Right. But in this one, he's the only character that kind of makes an emotional shift. Yeah. So it's a more complex character in a lot of ways, as yeah. opposed to, there's nothing wrong with it. The, the story goes this way, yeah. and not a lot of people get the opportunity to learn something from it. Right. So to see him make that change, and it's like, I, I don't know, the character had a little bit more in this one, plus it's the iconic one. Sam Jackson is the best arbiter of Tarantino's mm -hmm. words. And this is the reason it's Pulp Fiction for me as well, Matt, is because this is the one that announced Sam. Yeah. That Sam was a character actor. He was doing work. He was working all around. But this one put him on the stratosphere of st stardom. Don't you love his Capital One co uh, commercial? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, it's, if, if you got to do it, man, you got to work. Good for you. I don't yeah. know what they had to pay you for that day, but he's, congratulations. He's, he's certainly doing the Sam Jackson version yeah. of the Capital One Every time. Look, the man found a hook, and yeah. he is riding that to seven-figure, like, you know, paydays left and right. He's just missing the mf -er. Like, what, what's in yeah, your wallet, it mf -er? It's you know? the same attitude. It's the same thing. Absolutely. Uh, and, and in this film, you really see him come into his own because of the twist that happens at the end where he gives up this life that he was so good at. You know, the Ezekiel speech. My God, that's still one of the best monologues ever on screen and it's Tarantino's words directing Sam Jackson saying them and that's why it's on our list I wonder if when he <clears> was writing it he had him in mind because later on in did. the characters he brings to life he obviously does you, you yeah. know that he wrote that part for him yeah. but that first one is just like wow it's your now you're what I envisioned for Quentin's inner monologue yeah. in a lot of different scenes it's yeah. just like he's visualizing now this this and this mm -hmm. but 
if they didn't know each other beforehand, like yeah. that's even more impressive. So right now, the YouTube channel is absolutely loaded with interviews from San Diego Comic-Con. If we highlighted them all here, we'd be here all day. So I'm just going to preview two of them. First one up is Power Rangers. I did that one myself, which I was super hyped about. And I think it went pretty well, minus the fact that I didn't get to ask about boob armor. You also brought up while they're coming over poses. Are we talking poses like the original Power Rangers poses or something no, more naturalistic? No, I, I was speaking more so like before you fight somebody, it's not like you're just standing there and then you just like attack. Um, I, I've like before I would fight somebody. I don't know. I'd you know find give find my balance and then yeah. put my hands up. But I think it's it's different when you're as your character. You do yeah. think like I wouldn't do this like Becky G. I would do this like Trini. Right. Mm. So not specific fighting poses. I just and, meant, like, and we are seventeen year old kids. So <laughs> don't get me exactly. wrong. At first we are like, uh, uh, what do we do? Because we don't know how to fight. That's the whole idea. Um, so yeah. It's I a think learning process. If there are any poses, it would come out naturally as a part of the movie. Like yeah. if someone recognized that as like a moment in the movie where yeah. they're like, okay, wow, that was amazing. That might have, that might become a meme or something. I don't know. Yeah, a meme. <laughs> a meme. Next up, let's shift on over to the Marvel press line where Steve got to talk to Dr. Strange director, Scott Derrickson. Are, are your pickups like plussing or is it more like really just pickup shots? It's more, it's, it, it's just it's plussing and it's it's pickup shots to clarify the logic in places you know um, small stuff it's nothing nothing too big luck, fortunately what did you learn from your first friends and family screening and who did you invite I didn't invite anybody uh, I figured any anybody I, it's, I think the way it typically works I don't think anybody from Marvel invites actual friends and family it's people that Disney knows are are not gonna you know tweet about it or take pictures or anything like that. So they're actually people who don't know the filmmakers. The thing I learned, from, we've had a few test screenings and the overwhelming thing I've learned is that people love Benedict Cumberbatch in this movie. They just love him, you know? I mean, it's kind of the headline, I guess, you know? They love the visuals, they love the action, but more than that, they love Benedict. And he is Doctor Strange. And it is as big of a scale movie as it is and as weird as the visuals get, it is still a story about one guy. It's about one guy overcoming himself and his own ego. No surprise here, the TV Talk panel was talking about Comic-Con stuff as well because there was so much TV at Comic-Con this year. Can't cover it all here, but we're gonna briefly highlight their discussions on Walking Dead and Game of Thrones. Josh, why don't you talk about how, what you thought about this? <laughs> I think you're a little more positive on it than someone Yeah, I was else. really positive. What? Jesus. Until somebody started <laughs> yelling at me. Jesus Christ, <laughs> you gotta help us all. Oh. This was a great last dead. show. Thank you for Fear watching the TV Walking Talk. Dead. Can you make up your damn <laughs> mind how you feel about this show? I can't. I am such a waffler when it comes to all of this stuff. I'm sorry. I For some reason, it like it was a little emotional. Eeny, uh, meeny, yeah. flashback. <laughs> Miney, flashback, <laughs> Mo. What about flashback. the fact that, like, the, as this stuff's going, I'm like, I'm getting nauseous because it's just. I like, started skipping it. Yeah, I was skipping ahead. Whatever. That yes. was garbage. We did get to see Jesus make a pretty cool move. He did like some spin move, like ooh, yeah. slicing people up. That was kind of yeah. cool. That, that, that was cool. That looked cool. like crap. Oh, Whatever. We're all gonna watch the pilot. We I know. know it. The thing is, like, I'm complaining, <laughs> but I'm gonna watch it. I'm gonna point. contribute gonna views do. to the show. I'm gonna watch the first episode of this next season, and then I'm gonna let you. Grew ups, love you. Talk about it until the last one. And then on the last episode, I'm going to be like, I didn't watch the season, you guys, because remember, it sucks. <laughs> All right, what's next, uh, Sinead? Uh, Game of Thrones, season seven tease. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, he's doing her, uh, her Game of Thrones dance. There Victory you go. Dance. Oh, yeah. my God. It's good. They showed us nothing, they and they gave us everything. <laughs> Basically, they showed like slow motion of a needle on a sewing no. machine, and I was like, that's brilliant. It's so <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Give that sewing machine an Emmy. It's amazing. <laughs> Now it's time for the Collider.com portion of the show when we get to highlight some written features done by the team over there. First up, Comic-Con stuff. If you had a tough time keeping track of all the new trailers that dropped, this article is for you. The Collider.com staff compiled a feature with every single trailer that dropped from Justice League to American Gods, Kong Skull Island, and more. And next, Chris Cabin did us all a major favor by listing everything we learned about the upcoming Marvel movies and TV shows in one single article. He's got the Brie Larson casting confirmation in there, some information from the Luke Cage panel, and so much more. 
Switching gears a bit, we've got a feature from Katie Burt titled How Harry Potter Became an Escapist Saga for Millennials in a Post-9-11 World, in which she discusses how the success of the Harry Potter franchise stems from its timing and how it dropped during a time of a great shift in political and social consciousness in the United States. Next up, in honor of the release of Jason Bourne, we've got a piece from Dave Trumbor covering how the character of Bourne has evolved over the years from film to film. Wrapping up the dot-com section of the show, we've got a big ranking piece from Adam Chitwood. Christopher Nolan's movie is ranked from worst to best. No doubt everyone here will have opinions on this one, so check out the list and see how closely Adam's rankings matches yours. We've got a big match for you on the Schmodown this week. It is Clark Wolf versus Sam Levine. Big one because the winner of this one plays Dan Merle for the title. Let's check it out. The guy is like the rain man of movies. He knows everything. I'm, I'm astonished at how much knowledge Sam has. And so that is what is making me a little bit nervous. Hal Rudnick and Jeff Snyder, who I had to beat to get here, they were chumps compared to Clark Wolf. She could wipe the floor with those guys. He is the inglorious one, Sam Lovie. There he is. Just look at him. He's, he's very, very modest. No, he's very modest. But you know, you look at him. He's calm, cool, collected. Excellent facial hair trimming. With a record of two wins, no defeats. Ladies and gentlemen, she is classy. Clark Wolf! Always the big smile on her face when she comes out. Even with scary music. In which movie does a wealthy man announce to his son's kidnappers, congratulations, you've just won a $2 million lottery ticket as he offers a bounty on national television? Ransom. Correct. Clark wow. Wolf. Wow, running the table. What actress plays the title role as stepmom to Ed Harris and Susan Sarandon's children in the 1998 movie? Julia Roberts. <laughs> yeah, that, that might as well have been multiple choices. Might as well have been multiple choices. Six choice. or six. Woo! I told you this was the championship match right here. It's Meme of the Week time, when we get to highlight a piece of artwork or a meme created by one of you kind viewers. This week, our big winner is Graham Butler, who sent in this image that shows what happens when a shit rat is sitting next to someone who's sick. Do you want your meme featured on the show? All you gotta do is create a piece of art or a meme based on something that happened on one of our shows this past week. Send it on into mailbag at collider.com or tweet it at us and use the hashtag Collider Best of the Week. Bloopers! Okay, is this loud? Is this loud? I just wanna not make your ears hurt. Hey guys, my name is Michael Lex. Yes. Talented. <laughs> Maybe not so talented. <laughs> when are you gonna see Justin Timberlake with a frizzy? No, 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 no. I don't want to. I don't want to insult Justin Timberlake. Well, so now I'm a sexist moron and I'm an idiot and I have an eight-year-old taste. You guys are really cool in the chat room for the most part. Hi guys. For Collider News, I'm Mark Riley. Like I, I was. I'll be honest. I was. Oh. Thank you. But some of you guys need to stop typing on your computer, you need to go outside, take a walk around the block, get back in here, maybe get a job, support somebody, and stop yelling at me. <laughs> What's our next story, Ashley? Exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> yes, it's me. Well, I have to be honest with you. Commando is not a three out of five. Uh, Commando, as an action film, is a five out of five. Hey guys, for Collider News, I'm Sean Connery. About to check into the base motel real soon. <laughs> right. You drive in, you go, you get the guns, and you chop off arms and heads. Which, who gives a shit, really? It's because of the name, Dope. You're a dope. And guess what? I'm be playing Marion. Mm -hmm. Hands chopped off everything, just going, it's it's fantastic. No, Sean Connery hasn't watched Dope, nor does he watch anything. He's a fucking asshole. It'll be better than Hot Guy and Hot Girl. Uh, uh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> that just yeah, sorry, scared, <laughs> that just scared the crap out of me. <laughs> Bloopers. Bloopers from you see it San here, Diego folks. Comic Con. Oh, he just puked. Oh, look. oh man. Nice to meet you. You're amazing. 
like, no big deal. Shana, no. Shana, you twin. Quieter, 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 Shana, you twin. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Trailers, okay. trailers. You should... Shania Twain in August. Right. My energy! Woo, woo! Shania. <laughs> like, so, like, you know, like, when you're Dying. hot and you have sweat going on your back and you can oh, kind of yeah. just feel it, like, slowly going into your butt? Like, Speaking that that's which, what I'm going through right now. It's been a while since we've heard any updates on the future of that talk. <laughs> For a more detailed breakdown of the Comic-Con footage we have on Homecoming and to get our cocks going hard, really good. Well, you know, when that last little trickle goes <laughs> down, he was like, Ey. You can feel it. <laughs> it's impossible to deny that Watterson is rocking a new cock. However, newly cast Lupita Nyong'o did reveal the cock. She was just like, she's got a big cock. <laughs> Okay! <laughs> I need to make sure that he looks good. And yeah, he's here in makeup. I think he's rolling. So who is your favorite on Collider? Uh, I'd have to say John Gambia. I mean, you didn't have to say Ashley Mover or anything. Or Ashley. So. So who's your favorite on the Collider team? Um, John Snap. I'll take I'll take the answer, but I'm not gonna be offended or anything. I'm not gonna be offended. You're number two. The fro is not working. Who's your favorite on Collider? You. Smart woman, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I'm doing that thing again where I don't know what to do with my hands. Over on the TV side of things, Wes is currently playing. Where can everybody find the big friendly giant? Christian Harloff, where can everybody, oh, there they go. Okay, Wendy Lee, where can everybody find you? Ah, <laughs> oh, you blew it, <laughs> you blew it, you blew it. <laughs> you're like, you're walking, and you're walking, right? And you're walking. Wait, you have like to people, crouch down and be, yeah. People, because they walk. Yeah. And you know how they, like, when they walk, they use their arms when they walk, it's like, that's a thing. I jiggled. And he says, how did Leah field Hans dead? Solid effort. As you, Skittles. <laughs> as juicy you move, fruit. As you pom -pom, move forward, yeah. Fibble fim. Scrambles. Scrambles. And F you. I am a little teapot. I'm short and stout. I'm just crazy. Everybody bloop. That was the best something. minute of broadcasting I'll ever do. That's right. That's a wrap on this week's episode of Collider Best of the Week. You guys know what to do. Hit the comment section below and share some of your favorite moments from this week's lineup of shows. I am Perry Nemiroff. You can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at pnemiroff. Go on over and bookmark Collider.com. Subscribe to the Collider Videos YouTube channel. Please watch and read everything, but just in case you don't have enough time, that's what Best of the Week is for. Have a good weekend, everyone. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.